So as Pastor Dave said, we have been in a series called The Resurrection Effect, and we have been talking about how the resurrection of Jesus powerfully impacts our life. In the last few weeks, we have shown that the resurrection power of Jesus is available to us as Christians. This is good news, isn't it? We've also seen that we can rise to a new life and we can become true witnesses of Jesus Christ. You know, as we were preparing this series, one thing we realized is that the resurrection of Jesus isn't just a nice, great ending to the gospel story. It fulfills it, but it also is just the beginning. The resurrection of Jesus continues to ripple effect through our lives even today. So I'm going to continue this thought of the resurrection effect as we as I preach today. But first, I want to ask you, how many of you out there love trivia? How many of you like trivia? All right, well, here's a definition of trivia. It's details, considerations, or pieces of information of little importance or value. So let me give you a little bit of trivia this morning. Did you know that a snail can sleep for three years? Three years. Did you know that all polar bears are left-handed? Did you know that it takes about one week to make jelly beans? Just one jelly bean a week to make jelly beans. Did you know it is physically impossible for pigs to look up in the sky? The average shoe sole is covered with 421,000 bacteria and 90% of that bacteria is directly transferred to your tile floor as soon as you walk in your house. Did you know that the tooth is the only part of the human body that cannot repair itself? Did you know that the reason that honey is so easy to digest is because bees have already digested it? Yummy, all right? Did you know it's against the law in Kansas to catch a fish with your bare hands? I don't know if you know this, but there was a third Apple computer founder, Ronald Wayne, who sold his stake in the company for $800 in 1976. And this last one has been debated, but did you know that it is impossible to lick your elbow? Did you know that? Now, I know, I'm going to pause right now because I know some of you are trying it. I know you are. I know you're out there, and you were trying it. That it is impossible to lick your elbow. Now, there's some people out there who say, yes, I have done it. I have a very long tongue, and I, ha I can move my elbow up. But they say it's impossible to lick your elbow. You see, knowing all this trivia is fascinating. Knowing all this trivia is eye-opening, and it may even motivate you a little, but it will not transform your life. You see, there's a lot of information out there, but there's not a lot of transformation. And the truth I'm going to share with you today, church, is not trivia. This is a truth you need to know. You have to know. You have to believe what I'm about to share with you this morning because it's going to affect the victorious Christian life that you live. We have to know the truth I'm about to share with you. So let's go to our main text for this series, 1 Corinthians 15. And here we go, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised from the third day according to the Scriptures. If you ever wanted to know and ever wondered why did Jesus have to die on a cross, here it is. Jesus died for your sins and my sins. He paid the penalty. He took the guilt of our sin upon himself on that cross. This is why he had to go to the cross. Our sins are forgiven. Our past, present, and future sins. When God looks at us, he sees Jesus. When God looks at us, he sees us as his children, all because Jesus went to that cross. This is great news. But the question is, how is this any different from what was going on in the Old Testament? You know, they would take the blood of goats and lambs, and they would atone and forgive, and they would receive this forgiveness. So what difference did Jesus Christ made when it comes to our sin? Well, let's read on in 1 Corinthians 15. 
But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. I want to focus on verse 17 today. The Amplified says, If Christ has not been raised, you are still in your sins under the control and penalty of sin. So if you've ever wondered what the resurrection effect is on your sin today, this is it. If Christ had not been raised, you were still under the penalty of sin. You were still under the control of sin. But Christ has been raised. And this is good news for us today. He gives us victory over sin. He breaks the chains of sin's control. Now, some of you might be hearing me today and think, Amy, I've not experienced that. This is not something I've tried. I, I've tried to believe this, and I haven't experienced this. Well, don't give up on me. I'm going to share with you something today that I believe is going to powerfully change the way you see what Christ has done for you. I want to go on to 1 John 3, 5 and 6. And John writes here, You know that he appeared in visible form and became man to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him, abides in Jesus, lives and remains in communion with and in obedience to him, deliberately, knowingly, and habitually commits or practices sin. Church, listen to me. Jesus appeared to take away sin. He came to take away the control and power of sin in your life. You are not to continue to live bound by sin. Paul, I love how John says, you know that he appeared to take away sin. I love how he emphasizes, you know, you've got to know this. You've got to be convinced of this. You've got to believe this at the very depth of your soul and spirit that Jesus came to take away sins. This is God's goal for you. And yet many Christians still believe they can't change. That that's just the way they are. That they just have to continue to rack up a list of sins and say, but at least I'm forgiven. But church, listen to me. If all that Jesus accomplished on the cross was your forgiveness, we could have gotten that in the Old Testament. That's not all that Jesus accomplished. He accomplished much more that we're going to find out today. You know, I was thinking this morning as I got up, I was praying, I was thinking about this COVID-19 crisis. And I was thinking about how so many people are, are in a place now where they're home when they used to go to work. Their kids are home when they used to go to school. They're having to practice social distances. There's a lot of loneliness going on a lot of depression, a lot of addiction. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ sees it, and he knows, and he knows what you're going through. But I want to give you a message of hope this morning that you do not have to continue to be bound in sin, under the control of sin. This is God's goal for your life. I love what John Bevere said. He said, many believers near the, need to hear this message of hope. You can be free from the power of sin. It is possible for Christians to raise, to rise above sin. Jesus did not just grant you a ticket to heaven. When he died, he set you free from the power of sin and death. Sin doesn't have power over you, but instead you have power over it. By the grace of God, right? Through God's grace and his divine power. One of the most common ways believers fail to use this power is they do not realize they have it. This is why John says in 1 John, you know. You know that Jesus came to take away sin. So let's go back to 1 John 3, verse 5. You know that he came to take away sin. In him there is no sin. Well, why would John emphasize in him there is no sin? Well, there's a good reason why. Because Jesus, who knew no sin is the only one who could take our sin and reconcile us to God. You see, we come to God 
sin-soaked, sin-stained, and we come to God, and we are separated from God because of our sin. But Jesus, who knew no sin, took our place on that cross, and he basically, basically cleansed us and brought us back into relationship with God. Only Jesus Christ could do that. The blood of goats and lambs in the Old Testament could not do that. A man cannot do that. But Jesus was the only sinless person that could do that. And you know what this means for you and I? He wants to change your relationship with sin. When I was 19 years old, I was at Michigan State University, and I was invited to a Christian meeting. And during that meeting, they played the movie Jesus. And it got to the point where Jesus was dying on a cross, bloodied and beat, whipped and bruised with, a, with, with uh, nails in his hands and his feet. And all of a sudden, I realized for the first time in my life that my sin put Jesus on that cross. I have to tell you, out of my remorse, out of my sorrow, out of a godly sorrow, I repented and I said, Jesus... My sin did that to you. And I have to tell you, all of a sudden, sin lost its value. Sin lost its pleasure. Sin lost that pull for me because I thought my sin put Jesus on that cross. You see, God wants to change your relationship with sin. So if you could put that verse back up, 1 John 3, verse 5 and 6, and I want to go to the second part of this verse. No one who abides in him, who lives and remains in communion with and in obedience to him deliberately, knowingly, and habitually commits or practices sin. That word commit is a very important word to know. It means you are so committed that you practice something over and over and over again until you master it. So if you commit to practicing an instrument, you get better and better and better at that instrument. If you commit to practicing a sport, you get better and better and better at that sport, right? So if you commit to practicing sin, it means you're getting better and better and better at it. It means you are habitually, that you are knowingly, and that you are deliberately choosing to do what you know is wrong. But for the Christian who has received what Jesus Christ has done for them on the cross— you don't want to deliberately, knowingly, and habitually practice sin. It's not in your nature. In fact, 1 John 3, 9 says that God, you cannot go on sinning because God seeds in us. We have a new father, and we want to be like our father in heaven. We want to be like him in nature and in character. We want to be just like our daddy. This is 1 John, what 1 John 3, verse 9 says, all right? So we want to do what pleases God. Now, I must say this, that we all understand that every Christian will, will, will have a wrestling with sin and temptation every day for the rest of their life. Isn't it true? Every day for the rest of your life, you will wrestle with sin and temptation. I heard a story about the great evangelist D.L. Moody. And a man came up to D.L. Moody and he said, Mr. Moody, I just want you to know that I am no, I, I do not commit any more sin in my life. And Mr. Moody, in his very practical way, said, well, I'd like you to ask, I'd like to ask your wife about that. You see, none of us are perfect. None of us are sinless. Only Jesus Christ is sinless. We will all wrestle with sin. In fact, we've all brought sinful habits into our Christian life from our past. For some, it's lust. For some, it's temptation to greed. For some, it's anger. For some, it's pride. For some, it is just a, um, a gossip. You gossip or you judge others. There's different types of sins and different characteristic sins that we're all going to go through, but all of us have a wrestling with our sin nature. In fact, ever since the fall, our nature has been to, to sin, to be drawn to sin, and even to try to find pleasure in sin. But I need to tell you something. You know what the world says to you? The world says, that's okay. That's okay that you're like, it's just who you are. 
You can't change. That's what the world says. In fact, they say, don't talk about sin. That's not healthy. Sin is not good to talk about it. In fact, it's just your personal choice. No, it's not true. Sin, Jesus came to take away sin. Sin is destructive. Sin will kill, steal, and destroy. It separates you from God. It keeps you from the call of God in your life. And it will hurt you and hurt those you love. So as Christians, our relationship from, from, with sin, because of Jesus, because of the blood of Jesus, is we do not have a desire and a heart to practice habitually sin anymore. We don't want to get better and better at sin, right? And so God knows our nature. God knows our propensity to sin, so he sent a Savior. I love Romans 6, 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that our body, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Interesting. Ruled by sin. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. A slave has no rights. A slave has no choices. But what this verse is telling us is that Jesus came and died on that cross and rose again from the dead to break the stronghold of sin in our life. We have a choice now. Before, we didn't have a choice. We have a choice now because of Jesus Christ. The Romans in the Passion Translation, the Romans 6, 6, says this. Could it be any clearer that our former identity is now and forever deprived of its power? For we were crucified with him to dismantle the stronghold of sin within us so that we would not continue to live one moment longer submitted to sin's power. Christian, you have a new identity. You have a new father. You have a new heart. Jesus Christ did not die on a cross so you could continue in sin. Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead so that you could have power over that sin. By his grace by his mercy, and with his help. And this is what we're going to talk about. Before I was a Christian, I would lie. Let me confess it to you today. I would lie. I called it a little white lie. And I thought, you know, it's not too bad. Everybody does it. It's not that bad. But then I became a Christian. And all of a sudden, when I lied, immediately I felt conviction. My relationship with sin began to change. I thought, and I felt this conviction from God. I thought, I can't ignore this anymore. And so I repented. I said, God, I'm sorry. I went from tolerating sin to hating sin for what it did to Jesus on that cross. I love Jesus. I don't want to sin because I love him so much for all that he's done for me. In fact, the closer I got to Jesus the more sin lost its allure, its power. So what is the resurrection effect on our sin? Jesus came to dismantle it so that we could no longer be slaves to sin. So this is how sin had a hold on me. I came from a family with a long line of addiction. My brother was addicted to cocaine and died of a massive heart attack at 37 years old because he was overdosing on co cocaine. My parents were addicted to alcohol and my dad uh, nicotine for, for his whole life. He died of cancer, in fact, because of it. My sister and I were addicted to eating disorders. And I've shared this with you before, where I literally starved myself in college. I had an addiction. Addiction ran through my family line. And then I became a Christian and I wrestled with jealousy Envy, pride, insecurity, and man-pleasing. But God has done a miracle in my life. I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I need to be, but I'm not where I once was. Jesus Christ came and did a work in my heart and set me free from the power of that sin in my life. He set me free. In a few minutes... I'm going to give you a few things that have helped me bat with my battle against sin and how Jesus has given me increasing victory in my life. Please 
If you're sitting here today and you're like, Amy, I've tried this and nothing has worked. I can't change. Don't believe it. Don't believe that lie. Jesus Christ is here today and he's going to touch you powerfully as we continue this message. I'll be back with you soon.